Hello? Michelle, if you want to make either me or Nicole a co-host, we can help with the waiting room yeah. as we're getting started, if that would be useful. I am listed now as the co-host. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay oh, perfect. Sorry, you. We're both there. perfect. And I forgot that today was an early release day. So I have another teacher stepped into the classroom, but I might have to jump out if she needs me. <laughs> but I have my earbuds in. Definitely understandable. <laughs> Michelle, don't, oh, never mind. You're already recording. It looks, Michelle, like the waiting room has slowed down a bit. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go ahead and start, I can monitor that. Absolutely. So hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the informational session for the pre-K expansion pilot grant. Um, this is being presented by the early learning team at the Maine Department of Education. Um, we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Michelle Belanger and I am the pre-K partnership specialist at the on the early learning team at the Maine Department of Education. Nicole. Thanks, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicole Mador. I'm the early childhood specialist at the Department of Education, and I also work on the early learning team. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the director of early learning in Maine's Department of Education and get the great pleasure of working with both, both Nicole and Michelle every day to support public pre-K and other things, early learning. And we do have a bonus member with us um, this afternoon um, who has agreed to help us monitor um, questions and everything. Um, Julie, do you wanna introduce yourself real quick? Sure, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Julie Raymond. I am one of the pre-K expansion consultants on the early learning team, and I'll be taking some notes today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just want to um, let everyone know that you can go ahead and put questions. Um, they can be populated into the chat box um, during the session or asked at the end. We do have a, um, a some time for questions. Uh, we will do our best to answer questions, but we may not be able to answer without further research or consideration, um, and we'll need to um, post them later. So responses to all questions asked during the recording, as well as questions submitted in writing will be compiled and incorporated into the Q&A section of the RFA and posted on the State's Division of Procurement Services website. <clears throat> and Michelle, would this be a good time for me to yes. say just a couple of things? So yep. um, thank you all for coming to the informational session this afternoon. This is a really good opportunity and something that we like to offer to the field before the department releases a request for proposals or a request um, for applications. It gives us a chance to 
kind of preview what we anticipate that the application is going to look like. But a couple of things that are really important to know is that this RFA has not been approved yet by our Division of Purchases. And until the time in which they officially approve it, there's always the possibility that there could be slight changes that are expected to be made. So um, we're going to do our best to share with you what we anticipate you're going to see in the application because we want you to have some time to start thinking about it, planning for it, having conversations that will be really important to putting a thoughtful application together. But we need to be very clear in saying that until it is approved and posted, there can always be some adjustments made to it. So we'll do our best um, to outline it. And then um, as Michelle was saying just a moment ago, answer the questions to the best of our ability. But once this is approved, at that point, we can no longer talk about it with the field. There's a very formal process for you to submit any additional questions that you might have at that time. Um, we will respond to all of those and post them, but we're not allowed to have any interaction about an application once it's posted. So we strongly encourage you to always go back and look at the official list of questions and answers that get posted because that it will be the way that you know exactly <laughs> what the responses were. Okay, I think that sets us up, the, right. the disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so eligibility to submit applications um, and the awards for the RFA. So eligibility is all main school administrative units um, and elementary schools seek seeking to establish new partnerships with licensed community providers are eligible to submit bids in response to this request for applications. Each SAU applicant must identify the licensed community provider agreeing to be a partner, and, and the SAU will be the person, will be um, the applicant and also the fiscal agent for the proposed program. And the department does anticipate making multiple awards as a result of this request for applications. The number and size will depend on the number of proposals we receive in available funds. The minimum number of spots per classroom allocation in a family child care provider will be no, should be no less than four children. And the maximum number of spots per classroom allocation by a center-based child care provider should be no, will be no more than 16. Um, so just to give everyone some information, just an overview um, through this application, uh, the Maine Department of Education intends to conduct a pilot to provide grant funding to school administrative units to increase the number of eligible four-year-olds attending high quality public pre-K programming in licensed community partner settings. This is both center and family child care. The funding is provided through the Preschool Development Renewal Grant. SAUs are required to partner with licensed community-based providers. So again, this is center-based child care or family child care providers. For this pilot, Head Start partnerships will not be considered. And a partnership is characterized by meaningful involvement in the planning, development, and delivery of the proposed, proposed program for student and families. We are just looking for um, some real evidence that um, the SAU and the partner are, are working together and delivering um, the programming. So all partner sites will need to meet the program standards that are outlined in um, Chapter 124, which are the basic approval standards for public preschool programs. SAUs may apply for grant funding awards for a one-year period that will support new programming in collaborations with up to one family or center-based child care setting 
for the 24-25 school year. Program can maybe either full day, full week, that, that reflects what the school administrative unit has, or part day, but must include at least 20 hours a week. Um, and so this is up from um, the 10 hours that are in Chapter 124. SAUs will need to establish a MOU with the licensed community providers. And upon successful implementation during the school year 24-25, grantees will be eligible for a second year of grant funding for the 25-26 school year. So only eligible children may be supported by the grant funds. Eligible children are defined as children who will be at least four years of age on by October 15th of the school year in which they are enrolled. All proposed general education pre-K classrooms should be inclusive of eligible four-year-olds, including those who are economically disadvantaged, have disabilities, and are multilingual learners. The least restrictive environment for uh, children with IEPs um, should be determined by the IEP team. And the funding for this grant is going to be by um, classroom size. And so um, funding for this grant is not attached to the school funding formula. Students attending public pre-K in the partnership classroom will be considered enrolled in the SAU, but those students will not be included in the SAU's ED279 student count. So the maximum allocations per range of students um, for a classroom size of four to eight students for full day, full week implementation will be up to, can request up to $88,000 for 20 hours a week, which is the um, four hours a day um, for five days, can request up to $68,000. A classroom size of nine to 12 students can request up to $132,000 for full day, full week implementation. And the 20 hours can request up to $102,000. A classroom size of between 13 and 16 students can request up to $176,000 for a full day, full week implementation, and up to $136,000 for 20 hours a week. I am going to pass it off to Nicole. Thanks, Michelle. So everything that Michelle just walked us through um, will be included in the RFA under part one of the application. Um, again, like Leanne said, there is still um, some time where some things could get um, changed or just not accepted yet. So we'll just want to make sure that when you do have access to the uh, final RFA that we're reading it um, closely to make sure that there hasn't been any major changes. But once you do get that, Part two of the application includes some other components. So we're just gonna dive into some of those so that you'll know ahead of time sort of what to expect. Um, so the, the basic components of part two is that applicants will discuss their, the general information of their project, um, specifications of the work that they plan to be performed. They'll have a detailed section around project description and project budget, as well as the competitive priorities. So all of those things will be highlighted and we'll walk through each of them now. Um, the only way that um, an application can be considered complete and scorable is if it is responding to each of these components. Um, so general information will include a debarment forum and a performance and non-collusion certification, which is part of all of our RFAs, as well as a partner listing with a letter of intent from that partner, whether it's a family child care or a child care center. Um, we'll wanna make sure that they're uh, understanding and signing off on this application from the get-go. 
And Nicole, okay. can I jump in one yeah. second? You might also, say what I was just about to say. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> just going, going back to the very first box on the left-hand side, there yes. will be general application cover page and some general assurances. Super, super important that all of these pages are included in your application. The um, general assurances page has both a spot for the superintendent to sign, but also for the school board chairperson to sign. Um, and then there's also a document for your community partner um, to have to sign off. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Leanne. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead, Michelle. That's fine. You can click ahead to move this here. Okay, so specifications of the work to be performed. This is part of component B of the RFA. So you'll want to make sure that under the overview of the project that you are describing the proposed partnership strategy um, and any of your intended goals. So some of ideas of things to include might be details around your current status of pre-K in your school administrative unit, whether one exists, what is it full day, part day, et cetera? Um, how many students are you currently able to enroll? Things like that. Um, if you don't yet have a public pre-K, then certainly that should be mentioned here as well. Um, additionally, you'll want to include the name and type of your licensed community partner. So family child cares are licensed differently than child care centers. So just try and be as specific as possible there. Um, and of course, the number of pre-K eligible children that will be served through this grant request. Michelle had showed you a table earlier that we can support anywhere from four to 16 students in a full day, full week, or part day, full week uh, model. So if the best to your knowledge, if you um, can highlight exactly how many children you intend to serve. And obviously that will also include the proposed hours of programming, what you'll be able to accommodate there. On the opposite side of that, we'll want to make sure that you're identifying any need and community coordination. So this is actually an ask of any public school that's um, starting or expanding a public pre-K program. We want to make sure that schools are aware of what already exists in your community to serve this age group. We also want to make sure that you have some level of communication and outreach to them so that they're aware of what the school is intending to do and vice versa. Um, it never hurts to have a, a working relationship with those in the field, or excuse me, those in your community, who are working with the same children and the same families as us at the school. Um, so we always like to encourage folks to do that. And part of this RFA will be a requirement as well. Um, so you should build a case for how your project will address those identified needs and lead to better outcomes for families. A really common strategy to get this done is through a community survey. Um, we know many districts that have created Google Forms or Microsoft Forms or Survey Monkeys to send out to current families already um, enrolled in the school with other children, to send to childcare, that exist in your community to post QR codes around the community and really gain information around what those families need or, or would like to have uh, in terms of a pre-K program. Is it something that they would access if their child was age eligible? If so, what types of hours and days and transportation etc. would they be, um, you know, supportive of. So getting that information right from the get-go uh, will be expected for this. Um, you don't have to use a survey. I imagine other schools, or I'm aware of other schools who have set up like community nights or community discussions for folks to come to the school and have a conversation in person or through a Zoom option. Um, that's another really great way to meet people and have those uh, open conversations and answer questions right on the spot. So how you gather that information is up to you. Uh, just be prepared to show what your plan was and what the results of that were. Um, and then as always, again, we'll wanna make sure that all school districts are showing a demonstrated coordination with child development services. So typically this is done through an MOU. All public pre-K programs should have um, a current MOU with their local CDS site. Uh, there are some districts that are able to take on some CDS responsibilities that would sort of bump you up into the level of having a contract, but we can cover that when the time comes. For the purposes of this application, just be sure to uh, demonstrate that coordination with CDS. And it, that should obviously include your partner program as well. Okay. 
Um, as you move through, you'll come to component C, which is the project description. Um, so these are some of the bigger bullets that you'll see that we'll want some real clear uh, discussion around. Some of these may start to feel a little repetitive, but that's okay. Just answer them like they're brand new questions. Um, so again, a description of the proposed project, including uh, your high quality programming, the nature of the collaboration with the SAU and the partner, how that will intend to be successful, an outline of what each partner will contribute, etc. Um, another common area of conversation with pre-K programs is the encouragement to create an enrollment protocol for pre-K. This will really serve you well in the event that more students register or show interest, then you're able to enroll. So for example, if you're looking to support 16 students in a partnership with a, a local child care center, but 20 students sign up and show interest, you'll want to make sure that you have an idea of or a plan for who's going to get those 16 seats out of the 20 interested families. Um, we, when asked, really encourage folks to make every effort to mirror your school population's demographics. So if your K-12 population is 10% students with IEPs, then try and reserve 10% of those seats or one or two seats for students in pre-K who might have an IEP. If 10% um, of your K-12 population is uh, low socioeconomic status, then try and reserve 10% or another one or two seats in addition to the IEPs for students who may qualify um, under that low socioeconomic status. So that's not a have to, that's just a strong encouragement. Um, we mentioned before that this work should really aim to include students and children from a diverse group of folks in your community. So that's just one way that we can ensure that we're really working to fill those seats in a diverse way. Um, so uh, description explanation around your recruitment and enrollment plan will be there. And then evaluation of the program. So this again, we have tools from the early, our early learning team that can help support you in doing this. If you have something that you're already using or something that you want to create with your teachers, by all means, but a description of how you plan to evaluate this pilot within your SAU and your partnership, and of course, its effectiveness of the pre-K program. Um, so just sort of keep that in the back of your mind and be thinking about how you might uh, do that. And then we, of all of our pre-K funding opportunities, we always like to ensure that districts have a plan for sustainability. So we don't want this to be a one and done. We really want folks to be thinking about um, sustaining what their project beyond the scope of what the grant can offer. So a, a description of how your school district um, and your partners will ensure that after the grant funded has ended will also be expected as part of this application. And then the project budget, the fun stuff. Um, so there will be a component D and there'll be a really clear explanation of the project budget. And as you can imagine, uh, we're gonna walk through those in just a moment as well. Um, but your budget should include the overall projected expenses of your proposed project. Um, we'll show the table again of the funding options, the, the sort of the ceiling funding options, um, but just make sure that we're staying within that allowable section of the table. Uh, your costs should be reasonable and justifiable for achieving high quality programming and meeting program standards. So in any section of the budget where you can be really specific about the amount of something, then we encourage you to do that. Some pieces you may need to estimate or ballpark, and we understand that as long as it's reasonable and justifiable. Um, any project budget worksheets that are part of this application should be completed and include descriptions of how the costs will be determined or how they were determined. Of course, an estimation of the number of students that you uh, propose to serve in the project. The school district and partner coordination and admin costs should not exceed 6% 
of the overall budget. So once you are um, sort of knowing where you're gonna fall in terms of the ceiling of the amount of funding you can ask for, uh, no more than 6% of that should be uh, allotted for coordination and admin costs. And then Appendix C, which we'll get to, I promise, I keep feeling giving you empty promises, Appendix C will really break down the budget table examples. And I think this is my last slide before I hand it over to Leanne, but this is uh, just another quick zoomed in photo of the budget table that Michelle shared with us earlier um, that shows the ceiling of funding depending on what type of project you are proposing. So in this example, you can see that the estimated total number of new pre-K slots included in the proposed project is six. And those six students are going to access a 20 hour a week program. So four hours a day, every day. So the most that that school that in this example could ask for is up to $68,000. So this particular example, we can't see exactly what that budget is going to be just yet, but the total amount that they're requesting is $60,500. So you can see here um, when you get to this part of the application, an example of how it might, might be filled out. So I'll leave that there for just a second. And then when Leanne's ready, I'll hand it over to her. I'm all set, Nicole. <laughs> so as Nicole was um, explaining, what, what we're going to sh share with you next are just a few examples of what the budget pages are anticipated to look like and to give you an idea of how you'll go about completing these. So I know that the print is super tiny um, on this particular slide, but what it's showing is what we refer to as budget table two. So in budget table one that we just looked at, that's where you're going to be acknowledging this is how many students we're serving and this is the type of programming, whether it's full day, full week, or it's um, the 20 hour a week option. When you move to budget table two, this is where you're going to be explaining what is your budget? What are the different costs associated with being able to provide a high quality program that aligns with chapter 124? So you will be outlining the various budget categories, how much you're budgeting and providing an explanation of those costs. The more detailed that you can be about those expenses, the better because this is this particular component will be scored just like all of the other components of the application. And a requirement from our division of purchases is that a quarter of the points have to be allocated to the budget. So this is a pretty sizable component. Um, and we would really just stress that you give this a lot of attention and really be as detailed as you can be in your budget. So, You'll start by mapping out the budget. What is this, what is your project going to cost to be able to provide this experience for the next school year? And once you've got all of your expenses in there, you'll total those up, keeping in mind what the ceiling is. So obviously if in this example, you are providing support to six students on um, that part week, or part day, full week experience, you can't go over the ceiling of the $68,000. That will be important as you're doing your budgeting to keep all of that in mind. But you can see that there are a number of different costs that you're gonna want to pay attention to. Everything from salary costs to instructional materials, to assessments, to um, potentially playground, um, the provision of food, possibly transportation, um, if that's something that you're going to work to being able to provide for families, um, professional learning, and so on. Once you have your entire budget mapped out, then you're going to move on to budget table three. 
And in budget table three, what you're going to be doing here is demonstrating how you're going to break down where this grant money is going. And by that, we mean the SAU is going to be the fiscal agent. The money will flow to the SAU. But through the MOU agreement, the SAU will be providing a large portion of that funding directly to their partner site. There are probably some costs that the SAU is better equipped to potentially handle the purchasing and payment structure for those costs than potentially the partner site is. And there will be some costs that will be easier for the partnership side to be able to handle. And that will be spelled out in your MOU agreement. But in this budget table, what you need to show is what you anticipate, where you anticipate those dollars will land. So is this a cost that the SAU will take care of through the grant money? Or is it something that the partner will take care of? So as an example, for instance, in this particular um, one that we're looking at, the partnership site is going to be hiring and paying the cost of the educator who will be providing the programming. It might be the case in some proposals that the SAU decides to be the one to hire the educator, but that educator actually works at the partner site. That's something that will need to be worked out between the SAU and the partner as you develop your proposal. So there's different ways that that could happen or play out. In this particular example, you see that this is being going to be handled by the partner themselves. And actually, there's quite a few costs in this example that the partner is going to be managing. Once you have divided up where those costs are going to go, you'll total them at the bottom and the totals of the SAU column and the partnership site columns should add up to what your overall proposal is, the amount that you are actually seeking um, in grant funding. So I think Michelle will move on and we included another example. So this is one for a, a larger project. Um, 14 children in a full day, full week program. And in this particular example, the project is seeking the ceiling or $176,000 to support this program. And like we saw previously, a budget has been developed that is outlining all of the associated costs to support these 14 students. In this example, you will see there's both funding for a lead teacher and for an education technician. You didn't see that in the previous example because the size of the program was only serving six students and that doesn't rise to the level of needing to have two teachers because under chapter 124, we have um, a one to eight ratio. But in this case, this example, there would definitely need to be more than one educator in order to meet those ratios. So again, all of the various costs are mapped out and explained so that it's clearly understood what you're asking and how you've come up with that amount and then totaled. And then you move to budget table three, where you map out who will be handling each of those cost categories. This is an example where the SAU is actually going to hire the educator, the lead teacher, but the partnership site is going to hire the education technician position. And so you see that those are costs that are split across the, the SAU and the partner. All of the cost categories are again totaled and then have to add up to that overall amount. Okay, 
Thank you, Leanne. That went through quickly. <laughs> um, so once the RFA is released and you've had a chance to peruse those sections that we've just gone through, you'll see that the scoring criteria will also be outlined there. But in addition to that rubric, we've also included opportunities to offer competitive priorities to folks. So we're just going to walk through those real quick quickly and you can sort of be thinking about whether or not this is an area of an application where you might be able to earn some extra points towards the scoring process. So one area that we'll be looking for um, a description of through your narratives as well as perhaps in the budget if it comes up is the level of economic disadvantage. So in your application somewhere you should identify what the SAU's level of economic disadvantage is. Um, so for schools that are serving less than 45%, then there won't be any competitive points awarded but you can see schools that are falling in the 45 to 60% range will receive an additional three points. And those that are over 60% level of economic disadvantage will receive an additional five points. Um, so once you are, we'll keep going through there, but just as a reminder, as you're working through the application, um, be thinking of these as well, and they'll be part of uh, the description. So another area where an SAU could be awarded competitive priority points is um, in their description of their commitment to achieving pay parity for lead teachers in the partner program. Um, so again, you can see where a school might be awarded points for detailed evidence versus no evidence. Um, this is an area of conversation that we talk with districts a lot around, specifically those that are functioning within a partnership. Um, and just wanting to assure that anybody that is providing education for eligible children in a pre-K setting are, are following along this pay parity, right? So that everybody's um, hopefully reimbursed equitably across the district. So if that comes up in your application description and you're able to provide uh, limited or detailed evidence of that, then additional points will be provided. And then another area will be the partnership with a licensed family child care provider. So as we've mentioned a few times, licensing um, is different for family child cares than it is for child care centers, specifically the ratios that are um, able to happen in this setting. Um, we have a number of districts that are already partnering with child care centers, which is wonderful. Um, and part of this funding is aimed to support continued growth in that area. But also we're really looking for districts to uh, reach out to your local family child care providers and see if a partnership can't be successful in those settings as well. Um, and in the event that they are, competitive priorities are available um, for yes or no answers. Uh, is that reversed, Michelle? Can you go back just a second? Sorry, I'm just looking at this now. So partnership with a licensed family child care provider, yes, should be five points, correct? Okay. And if your answer is no, then that would be zero points. So just know that those points are switched. <laughs> Thanks, Leanne. I said, could see your head nodding. Um, and then another competitive priority is the number of instructional programming hours. Um, so for this particular grant, you're either going to fall under the category of full day, full week, which is five or more hours a day. Um, in the event that you're able to accommodate that, then you'll get an additional five points. Um, if you're looking to provide at least 20 hours a week, um, but less than full day, so four hours a day across five hours, um, then there's no additional competitive priority points for that particular scenario. And then you'll see at the end of the RFA, there are three appendices. So more information around emergency and conditional certification for staff will be found in Appendix A. Any questions um, that have been submitted will be found in Appendix B. And then Appendix C will be budget table examples. So similar to what Leanne just walked us through, um, you'll be able to see some of those at the end of the RFA as well. And, and actually, sorry, Nicole, Appendix B is actually the form on which um, you will be submitting your questions. So if you have additional questions that you want considered and responses provided for, 
that's where you will um, record them and then submit them to us by a particular date. And that will be clearly denoted in the RFA itself what the date by which questions must be received is. All right, I can tell we have some questions in the chat box. So maybe we can start by walking through those. Um, Katie, you had asked if you'll have access to the slides after the meeting. Um, we can definitely post the slides that were provided. We'll probably fix the one with the um, little typo on the competitive priority um, before we do that. And when we post them, just know the caveat that should something end up getting changed in the RFA, not to be reliant on the slides for the information, make sure you are looking in the approved RFA when it is posted and follow the guidance that's outlined in that document. That is, um, when, once it gets posted, that is what you need to absolutely follow. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, Sessa, um, so you're asking, does this apply to minimum receiver districts who don't get money from the state currently? Um, if so, what would happen after the pilot? So this is open to all SAUs in the state, including um, the EUT programs, our education in the unorganized territories. Does not matter um, whether you are a minimum receiver or not, but there is an expectation for any SAU that's applying that part of what you are planning for is sustainability of the programming once the grant money is gone. Um, in this pilot, we are trying to provide um, an adequate amount of grant funding to be able to support the program over ideally the two years. Obviously, it, getting a second year funding is contingent on successful implementation in the first year. But as long as that happens, then there's an opportunity for another year of funding. Um, but after that, then the SAU needs to work on having a plan for how it will continue to support this project using its funding through the EPS formula. And, and an SAU may, as a minimum receiver, have to plan for that. What would that look like? How will they raise that money? The question about the next question, um, can there be more than one partner site as part of the MOU or can there be more than one SAU? So that's a really good question. Um, any SAU that is an applicant um, can only apply for, with one partner in this particular grant. Um, if the um, partner serves multiple children from multiple SAUs, um, there will need to be like one SAU will need to be the fiscal agent, but something that we'll probably need to take back and um, work on in the RFA potentially is, can there be some, um, like a superintendent's agreement for another SAU to send students. So thank you for that question. That's probably something we're gonna have to get clarification on and address in the RFA. Um, Stacy, is there a minimum amount of students that can be served? So the minimum is four students in a family childcare setting. And then Michelle, remind me, did we put a minimum in a center-based program? I think we did. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if we put one a minimum for center-based. Center -based. Okay. I know we did for family right. child care. Right. Family child care is four. Yep. Uh, are the SES criteria the same as the... CCAP. I think I'm thinking, Sessa, you're asking about CACFP, and they're not um, in the RFA. 
there will be a link provided for SAUs that goes directly to what their SES um, percentage is. So that's a pretty easy piece to be able to identify. Um, you just have to go through the link and look up your SAU and you'll be able to tell that what that percentage is. And let's see, Sarah, requirements for certification. So um, the requirements for the lead teacher um, is that they hold an 081 or an 029 certification. In the appendix that Michelle, or excuse me, Nicole talked about, there are um, additional details about options. Um, if you don't currently hold that, but there are some other avenues that you might pursue um, that would enable you to be able to attain that certification. For the um, education technician position, that is an um, EdTech 2 certification that's required. I think I answered Tammy's question. Will grants be less likely to be accepted in school districts that currently have a public pre-K and it is not full? Not necessarily. Um, all of the applications will be evaluated using the same criteria that's outlined. Um, and as part of the RFA, you will see the scoring rubric. So that will spell out everything that's being um, evaluated in your application. And Stephen, um, so each, certainly each SAU could submit an application to work with a partner. And there's no reason that it couldn't potentially be the same community partner. And if teacher salaries are higher at the partner school, can you request additional funds? You can't request more funds than the ceiling that's been set. So that's something you'd have to work collaboratively to determine how you're gonna handle the teacher salary. And Sarah, no, accreditation is not required. What is required is the ability to demonstrate that the licensed childcare can meet chapter 124. Did I miss any questions? Michelle, did you want me to take this or are you taking this one? I'm happy to. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so we do want to thank everyone um, for attending this afternoon. Um, and as Leanne said, um, you know, we are anticipating the um, the RFA to be released, um, you know, hopefully soon. And we'll have all the additional information that um in details that we've covered during this um, session. And this session, of course, how will be is has been recorded and will also be linked in the RFA. We'll stop sharing. All right. We're happy to stay on for a couple of more minutes if anyone yeah. has additional questions, but also know that um, if you've gotten what you need, you're more than welcome to jump off. Thank you so much, everyone. Leanne, there were two more questions in the oh. chat box that just came in. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, no, I just want to bring your attention to them. Yeah. Um, so, Amanda, will the pilot video, do you mean this meetings? I think so. 
recording if it's if you're referring to the yes. recording of the meeting yes, yes. yes. that yes. will be posted yes give us a couple of days it takes us a little bit to turn it around and get it up on our site and we'll send it to everyone who registered and then we'll also post it on our um, web pages and okay, does the student have to be four? Yes. Um, for the purposes of this grant, this is serving all eligible four-year-olds. So they have to be four by October 15th. There's a second part to that too. Oh, sorry. Can students to <laughs> K be included? Um, so that I think would come down to um a determination that you make with the SAU. Um, if you're deciding that a student, that it's in their best interest to attend pre-K for an additional year, um, then that's a decision that'll get made at the local level. But they have to at least be four by October 15th. Um, so Seth said the we don't know the deadline. If you're asking the deadline for application, we don't know that yet because until the Division of Purchases approves the RFA to post, we can't finalize the timeline. Our goal is to be able to provide um, about five weeks for responses for applications to come in so that everyone has enough time to develop a thoughtful application. Um, so is there a specific curriculum that you need to follow? Uh, no, um, it, but within chapter 124, you are expected to implement an evidence-based pre-K curricula, but there's no, not one particular curriculum that you would have to adopt. Um, so the funds would be allocated after grants are awarded um, and the Department of Education develops their contract with the SAU. As soon as that happens, then um, expenses can start to flow. But you can't make purchases for anything before a contract has been um, approved. So that's just really important to keep in mind. But we will get money out in time for those purchases so that you can have classrooms outfitted by the beginning of the school year. Yes, Stacy. in this case, um, for this particular pilot, you need to have at least four um, students in the pre-K program in order to apply for and receive that grant money or be considered for that grant money. So Jen, yes, that's correct. Um, each SAU applicant can only submit an application for partnership with one child care, licensed child care. For the purposes of this grant, not at all that we don't encourage more partnerships that please don't take it that way at all, but there's only so much grant money to to be dis disseminated. And um, we want to make sure that more than one SAU can potentially um, take part in this particular program. So yes, Kaylee, because it's public pre-K, and that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, students attending the program enrolled as a public pre-K student cannot be charged tuition for that. So the funding should be replacing that in order to enable those students to attend at no cost. If you're running a program or, or even in the case of um, a full day, full week program, if the student is staying on in your program, in your childcare beyond the, tip, the school days defined hours, or if it's a 
part day program and you're offering the opportunity for that student to stay um, for childcare after that time, then families would need to pay tuition for that portion, but not for the time that is defined as their public pre-K experience. Right, so Kaylee, yes. If this the school day runs from eight to two thirty, after two thirty, you would charge. Or if you run programming before eight, and that you have children getting dropped off, let's say at seven, you could be charging for the seven to eight o'clock time. Um, Sarah, in this particular grant, um, programs do need to run five days a week. So you can, it can either be five days a week, full day, full week, or it can be five days a week um, of at least four hours a day. So Kaylee, if you're asking about um, where you can get the information about what's needed for an 081 or the other options, um, which have to do with conditional um, certification or emergency certification, that's all going to be outlined in that appendix of the grant. But you can um, certainly find that through the certification office um, in our Department of Education. Or if you just send one of us an email, we'd be happy to point you to that, even at this point. Michelle can definitely do that. Can we share links in the chat for this purpose, Liam? Like a link to what, Nicole? To the certification page. Oh, sure. You can you can include Thank that. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I'm not sure if that link right there will take you directly to where the emergency information is, right. um, but that's something that Michelle has and can certainly provide. Um, so Kimberly, who do we report to, principal or superintendent? So are you asking on like as the program is being implemented, who would have the oversight? I just wanna make sure I understand your question. Um, I can't tell if you've answered that. Sorry about that. I was just curious oh, like- okay who's going to over or who do we answer to so if you have a if you're having a problem with a child and mm -hmm. you're talking with the parents but of course you have to probably let the superintendent know or do you let the principal know who's right. going to be our boss 
Yeah. So one of the pieces that you'll respond to in the um, the application will be what will be that administrative relationship with the school system. And so it could vary. In some school systems, it might be the principal of a particular school that's designated as the pre-K um, contact. And so there'd be, need to be regular coordination happening with that individual. Some school systems have a pre-K coordinator position, um, someone who's designated, and that could be the person. In some school systems, it might be the superintendent. A lot of times that will vary with the size of a of school system. It might be a curriculum coordinator in a school system who handles that responsibility. Um, so, but there needs to be some administrative oversight and coordination. And that should be happening regularly anyway um, with any partner. And we strongly encourage that that's part of your MOU agreement that you build out is what, what are the regular meeting times? How will those kinds of um, situations be handled together? Um, following the school calendar, generally, um, and Nicole, please jump in here on this one because you probably have a little more experience maybe with some partners if, if they have varied at all. Um, there's a minimum number of school days that have to be met. Um, and generally, most partners tend to operate in concert with the regular school calendar, especially if you are sharing things like transportation services, um, making sure that, you know, if there's an early release in a school system on a particular day or a workshop day that, you know, that works better for families who might have children already attending school in some fashion. Um, but you know, if it if there was a situation where school couldn't be, you know, wasn't being held, but the partner planned to be in operation, you could probably iron that out, um, what that would look like. You partners certainly have to keep track of attendance because the student is considered enrolled in the public school, even though they are attending at the partner location. Did you have anything else, Nicole, that you might add to that? No, I, I just to say that that would definitely be a crucial part of the conversation between the two partners. I mean, the requirement of public pre-K is that students have access. Um, well, the minimum requirement in 124 is 10 hours a week. For this pilot, it's 20 hours a week across 35 weeks, which is a typical school year. Um, so that's typically beginning of September through mid-June. Um, so you'll want to um, just clarify with the school district around you know, in service days, cancel days, snow days, you know, what will be the expectation during those times. Um, I would also encourage conversation around substitute teachers. If you have um, somebody that's out ill, will you be able to access the school district's list of substitutes or not? It's not for me to say yes or no to, but it, it's a conversation point to be had. And insurance... Kim, can you elaborate just a little bit on that one? Thanks for answering all these questions. Um, I know we have a minimum that we have to for licensing to meet for insurance, and but are any of these students going to be covered at all by the Brexit school system? Well, the school system because they're their students, right? Because they are considered enrolled in the school system. Um, I don't want to misspeak on this one. Um, so I think that's a really good question for partners to talk to their local school system about. Um, what's the what is their particular school's insurance policy say about that? Okay. Um, generally, once a student is enrolled in the public school, there's a certain level of insurance that covers mm. that student. Perfect. Thanks. Anybody else? 
have a question. <laughs> So Kim, if um, you're going to be serving children or enrolling them in school um, in our state, children who are enrolled in school, there's an expectation that they all have access to meals. And so there's going to need to be a, a plan worked out for that. Um, children need to at least be offered that option. Um, and you can use grant funding to help pay for that, whether that is a catering service potentially that the school system might be able to help with um, and deliver to your site. But um, it, it wouldn't be allowable for you to just expect that families will be the ones to put, supply those meals. It's totally fine if a family says, hey, we want to supply the meals for our child. We're going to send them with lunch and that's fine because this is what they like to eat and this is, you know, how we want to do it. But it's not, it wouldn't be okay to um, not offer those meals. Katie, that's a great question. Um, so I think reaching out certainly to um, your superintendent of an SAU is a really good place to begin um, to find out if this is something that they are either one looking into or two don't even know that's, you know, because Superintendents are super busy and there's lots coming at them all the time. Um, so they might welcome knowing that there's an opportunity they hadn't necessarily seen um, and doing some exploration to see what's possible. And that may lead to, you know, a superintendent may say, hey, love to have a conversation with you, but I think that it would be better handled by our assistant superintendent or this principal or our curriculum coordinator or a combination of them to explore the opportunity. Thank you. Really great questions. All right. Well, I know that um, some of the members of our team have meetings that they have to get to. So um, if there's no other pressing questions right now, we'll close the informational session. Um, but just know that between now and the time that the RFA gets posted, you are more than welcome to reach out with any other questions. And then once it does get posted, then that formal process kicks in. So you'll have to use the mechanism that's outlined in the RFA for submitting questions. And then the department will respond to those um, in plenty of time before it, applications are due. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Sorry, Michelle, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say thank you, everyone. Those were great questions. Yes, thank you.